Welcome, welcome to our live today on understanding herbal preparations. This is going to be fun. Um, I want to start off a little bit and give you guys a background. We typically, when we do these lives, we talk about essential oils. So this is new. This is different. We're going to talk about herbs today and nutrition and, and different herbal preparations. Um, my mom got into herbs in the early 70s. Mid 70s. And so she's pretty much been doing herbs, herbal preparations for decades now. Um, we're going to cover a lot of different things today. We're going to cover how to make a tea, the difference between a tea and a tisane, which is a cool word. Um, we're going to talk about we're going to talk about tinctures, the difference between a glycerin tincture and an alcohol tincture, and how you would make them, how to strain them, um, herbal salves, and different things without poultices, compresses. So hope that you will share this, um, push it out there, and tag any of your friends in it that you think might be interested in it. And we hope that you enjoy it. Um, we're going to start off with the nutritional value of herbs. Because if you don't understand the nutritional value, why would you bother to take it? <laughs> and why would you go to all the work of making your own? You know, it often astonishes people. And I hope you will go to the, the book I wrote, Butterfly Miracles with Herbal Preparations. Put a chart in there in the last in the last printing that is just kind of a basic thing of, of what herbs contain, what vitamins and minerals. And there's some information about what percentages you will get a lot more calcium in a lot better absorbable form from an herbal tea than you will ever get from drinking milk. And well, that's true of things like broccoli too, but it's kind of nice. If you make an herb into a tincture and take six or seven drops a day, you've pretty much covered some of your nutritional needs. It's, it's an easy way to get vitamins and minerals and in a balanced state that up, you know helps you uptake it as well. So a lot of information on that out there so yeah so i've been i just been told that we sound like we're in a tunnel and that the audio is not very good <laughs> um is there anyone that can comment and tell us is it is it livable i think we may swap out the mics here in a minute is it both of us or where we're sitting uh, to the mic or what have we got here it takes a minute to get comments so hopefully we like shouting down a rain tunnel we'll roll that up yeah we do <laughs> So happy to be here. Livable. <laughs> Livable, huh? <laughs> not, not wonderful. All right, well, we'll try to swap out the mic I'm having and bring me a different one. And I hope that's it. I don't know what has changed in here. Yeah, it's the same setup that we always have. So I don't know. Maybe like that. It's fine. Maybe I moved the ladder. No. <laughs> okay. Well, the first um, part, thing that we want to talk about is the part of the plant and the time of the year that it's harvested actually makes a difference to what nutrients are in it. And this is simply explained by in the spring, the plant's energy is pushing the plant forward. It's in a growing state. And in the fall of the year, the plant is putting everything down into the roots and it's storing it and it's getting ready to go dormant. And so the part of the plant that holds nutrition is very different depending on the time of the year. And with that said, you know, I once sent a woman out to, she had gout and it was, the weather was bad and we're 15 miles from the nearest doctor Kidneys. and she wanted to know how she could deal with her gout without going into town to fill a prescription. I suggested that she go outside in their barnyard and find a marshmallow plant. And of course she didn't dig down into the frozen ground to get the root, which would have been the most effective thing to do. She Indeed. simply lopped off the part she could find and made it into a tea. And within 24 hours, the gout in her feet was gone. It cleared up. Um, the above ground plants had enough, enough life to it's do what right. it needed yep. yes but the underground plant would have been better and then if you happen to need the flowering part of the plant like arnica arnica flowers make the very best ointment for bruises if you need that flower obviously you're not going to get that in the spring because <laughs> it hasn't flowered yet so and yeah comfrey on the other hand once it flowers the, the properties have gone into the flower and they're different properties than you will get from the, the leaf, leaf or the root so um, pretty much need to chop it down when it flowers and wait for it to come up again. <laughs> it can be pretty overwhelming. Um, I want to say to people who are getting new to herbs to don't eat the entire elephant at once. Maybe learn to make a tea and buy your herbs from a reputable herbal source and then learn to make tinctures, learn to make a salve next one, when, when just building blocks. And then once you've learned how to make all these herbal preparations and you can even buy prepackaged kits from Butterfly so where you're not mixing your own combinations and things. Once you've gotten comfortable with that, then you can start learning to wildcraft and and make, do your own type of thing. It's just eat it one little bit at a time. Well, people always think that, you know, 
Well, there's so much because I tend to give you 45 years worth of information. All at once. You're not required to do that. Just pick one little piece and I'm, I'm going to try this. Pick this a time. few herbs, learn how to use them well. We'll kind of yep. cover that in a minute. So. This time of year, so it's it's mid of August when we're making this recording. Um, I just noticed the other day I was walking that rose hips are starting to turn red. And that means that rose hip tincture is ready to be made. And it be better after just a little frost. They need to be, but, yeah, when it freezes. Well, it got frost. down to 42 where I lived the yep, other day. It's coming real So we're close. getting really close <laughs> to freezing. And as soon as it does drop below that freezing, then I'll run out and I'll just throw them in a jar and tincture some of those. It's a great, um, it's a great vitamin C. So I remember one of the things. days when a couple of you kids went up the mountain and brought me a whole five gallon bucket full of rose hips. <laughs> I wondered what you thought I was going to do with all that, of That's a lot of rose hips. We're all excited. <laughs> that, happy with I know. Time. And that was a lot of. <laughs> Alcohol and a lot. <laughs> All right, here comes our new mic. You are so cute. Here it comes. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the internal or external use of herbs and why you'd use them internally versus externally. Well, Thanks internally is quite obvious because they are so nutritious that you need to get them in inside of you in order to be helpful. But so. but sometimes you need them externally. Like arnica oil is used for bruising. It's used for swelling, it's absolutely amazing, but Arnica is not an herb you can actually take internally. It's poisonous. Except as a homeopathic. Except as a homeopathic. So that is often used as a carrier oil. Um, it's called a fixed oil, and you just soak the blossoms in an oil, and then just rub that on swelling. I'll tell you a really cool story about that, actually. my I was at, I was at a church meeting, and I was in a room, and my son come walking in, and, and his, his two friends were explaining to me because he was a little out of it. He walked <laughs> smack dab into a metal door. He was growing the most amazing unicorn on his unicorn forehead corn. that, I don't know if he'd just been talking or what, but he just walked right into that metal frame. So I live right close to the church, so I just ran him home real quick, put some arnica on and brought him back. And the swelling went completely down. And the people that were there, they're not herbal, and they had seen how big that was going to be. Like, what in the world did you do? <laughs> you know, we get so it used so to simple. these one minute I, I didn't wonders. Even think about it. I we knew get it so used to these one minute wonders that we don't, you know. <laughs> I, yeah, and they're like, what did you do? You like, it. I just rubbed on it and brought him back. Well, are you? He doesn't have a concussion. I checked. He's fine. <laughs> if it swells on the outside, there's less chance of anything it going on, on the inside. inside so so. I, I was all happy with it. He, he was happy. I offered him ice, but he just went back to mutual and was happy. Happy to be there. So give us one second while I swap these mics, and hopefully that will help. I don't have to do any resetting on the. Okay, can everybody still hear us? <laughs> Did it work? <laughs> and is it better? That's the second question. Don't know. Maybe my mic's dying. If if you get no comments back, we'll assume they don't. Hear if we us don't get any comments back, we'll assume they can't hear us. I could type that in there. <laughs> Technology. I swear, the more of it we get, the less we know how to work it. Yes, we can. Okay, I don't know if it's any better, but <laughs> I've done what I can at this point. So, another example of an external use would be a compress or a poultice. And why don't you tell me the difference between the two? Well, the difference between a compress and a poultice is what part of the plant you use. You begin the same way. You put your plant material in water. With a compress. You use only the water part. You use the tea to soak your, your cloth in, yep. and that goes against your body. In a compress, you actually use the herbs as well as the liquid, and you fold the herbs into the compress itself. So an example of a time when you would use a compress. Well, I use poultices a lot. I'm I not say, I always use life. poultices because the herb makes it better. And usually when I'm using a, a poultice, I'm trying to pull infection and I want that extra. When would I use a, a compress? I'm sure somebody has a better reason out there, but I would <laughs> use it when I'm putting it on a child who can't be counted to keep the things still. folded up and I don't want to vacuum don't all the herbs all out of the bed it. and all over the carpet, you know? Thank you, Kelly. I appreciate <laughs> so, that. She says this sounds great. No worries. So. Great. That's Maybe. probably not the best reason for one or the other, but that's actually... I've actually had that. I've had kids that can't hold still when I put a, a poultice on them no and they've matter. gotten... And yeah, if you sew it shut, I swear they can still make a mess. Well, and when I, I just wait for it to dry and then it vacuums dried up. Yeah, it does. Um, if you try to clean it up while it's wet, it's a bad deal. <laughs> so... So usually if I've got a kid that needs a poultice, I put them on an old blanket. If I'm poulticing, I'm pulling infection. Otherwise, I would have used an essential oil. And if I'm pulling infection, I want the herb there too. I want the poke root. Yeah. I want yeah the mullen. I want to pull. So mastitis is a great um, 
reason for using a, a compressor of poultice. Oh, the stories I could tell you about. Yep. <laughs> I thought I would shoot my husband when I finally sent him to town for an antibiotic. And he came home with yet another herbal poultice, In which 70s. actually worked. Yep. <laughs> the reason it worked is because he finally heard the word to make the poultice using distilled water. Yeah. And so I really want to emphasize that when you are making a poultice or a tea or anything, chlorinated water, water with chemicals in it will destroy the medicinal properties of herbs. I had done herbal poultices for mastitis before and they had not worked. But that batch, same recipe, same made in um, distilled water. It Distilled water is empty. It pulls the herbs, it pulls the herbal properties. So I'm going to put this right here on the screen for uh -huh. everybody to see. And this is, if I can, if I can get it to. I'm sure glad I just do it. Here. Hmm. <laughs> I don't, is that, oh, yep, it's on there. Okay, so that is a link to step-by-step -step instructions. It's actually one page. It's printable um, for how to make a poultice, the exact instructions. Um, but it, it's really simple. You just take a piece of, I take an old cotton sheet and I, I just keep one up above my dryer and I just cut the next strip off. You want to cut it a little bigger than twice the size that you want. You're going to put, I, I put a piece of plastic, um, strand wrap works great. Um, and then I put my sheet down. I put a little oil, um, depending on what I'm doing. Arnica makes a great one <laughs> because of the anti-swelling properties. Coconut will work and a pinch cooking oil will work. Um, we used to a long time ago even just use shortening, but you don't want your skin to absorb yeah, the fats and that? the triglycerides. <laughs> no, we don't do that anymore. No. But you know, before we got smarter, so it, it's really not important. Anything is better than nothing. Of course, there are things that are better. Um, arnica would probably be my first choice if I had it. So, but if I didn't, coconut, carrier oil, almond, whatever I had would be fine. Okay, then I'm going to you take your herbs and um, depending on what kind of herbs, Water. leaves which we're going to get to again in tea. You guys are going to get really tired of hearing this, but leaves, you don't want to boil leaves. You want to boil roots a little bit, but leaves, you just want the water to be right there. It's about to boil and you're going to let them seep in there for 10 or 15 minutes. Put the lid on. Cover them so you don't lose all your, your volatile oil. all the oils at the top. Let them seep and then you're going to strain those herbs off and put them over the top of that oil. Then you're going to fold the other half of the sheet and that goes against the skin. And if you're smart, you'll fold in the sides and try to make a little and, pocket and try to keep kind of from holds. I like to use old, uh, old um, pillowcases. Yeah, because then you'd only have and the I top. To just cut as big, you know, the end off and pick them up. And you get a nice little something. corner. To work you got a little pocket and you've only got one place to um, watch the herbs fall out of. <laughs> and then a heat pack, either a rice pack or a heating pad, whatever you have, even an old sock filled with rice and warmed up in the microwave. We'll do it fine. Pick, huh? Not picky here. Okay. <laughs> Um, so that's poultices in a nutshell, and if you want more information, you can follow. The compress that is just you use the tea that you steep you, rather than the herb. You just soak your cloth in the tea and use that. So, right where you oh liniments. liniments. Mm. So a liniment is pretty much the same thing as a tincture, um, except that instead of taking it internally, you're going to use it in mass quantities, and you're going to rub it on. Um, the majority of liniments are made using rubbing alcohol. Yes, which and makes it cheaper. And I certainly did that when I was younger. But then I actually did some reading on the toxic properties of rubbing, rubbing alcohol. alcohol. And you, the alcohol will absorb into your skin. Of course it will. If it didn't absorb, you wouldn't use it as the medium to try to pull the herbs into your body. So find a better plan. Yeah. <laughs> and make your liniment in a good quality carrier oil or even break down and use the vodka. This is the link to for the one page instructions of making herbal liniments, and it doesn't quite fit, doesn't look like. Um, so it's liniments, I don't know if you can see that nts.pdf, and that it's also going to be in the blog that's going to come out later today. And that is step by step instructions. Um, an example of a time you'd want to use a liniment BBL is probably the one that I use the most as a liniment, and BBL is black cohosh, blue cohosh, blue vervain, and mobilia. And it is an absolute amazing nervine. So if someone has hurt their back, I'm rubbing essential oils on it. I'm doing other things. But the nervine properties, the painkilling properties of BBL make it absolutely you amazing. You might notice I keep flashing this little red pile there. 
um, I did some damage to tendons and nerves, and I actually used the BBL tincture. I soaked the tincture, yeah. <laughs> soaked a rag with the tincture and wrapped it around my thumb. It worked very well. I've, I've used it for menstrual cramps that are really, really bad. Um, I'm trying to think. I mean, I, I, BBL I has so, so many, many things. <laughs> Anything nerve-related and pain. It gets its own chapter in the yearbook. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing as a tincture, too, but it's one of the best examples well, really of using a liniment. Um, the next thing we're going to talk about is herbal salves, and they're a little bit more complicated. If you're going to start making your own herbal preparations, I would probably start with a tincture. Learn to make or a tea. Learn to make learning learning to make tea is so simple, um, and then learn to make a tincture. Salves would probably be my third step. But there's a nice video which is at the end of the blog you can watch to learn how to make salves. But salves are amazing. I use them all the time. I, I'm I'm going to tell you a little story about my neighbor, and I, I hope he doesn't. Hope he doesn't care. I don't think he would. But he cut his foot with a <laughs> lawnmower. Um, oh, yes, this was and recent. he called me up and he says, what have you got that I can put on this? So I've already been over to the doctor. I've already had stitches. Um, but it just hurts all the time. And I says, well, I've got some miracle salve you can put on it. And I gave him some yarrow because it can't hurt to, I mean, it was already sewed shut, but it couldn't hurt to disinfect it and just, just make sure we're avoiding the edges infection. together. Yeah. And, it, and it might help with the scarring a little bit, even though it was already stitched shut. So I brought him those two things and he used them over the weekend and he was grateful, whatever. And he, then he brought them back. And about 48 hours after he brought them back, he called me and he goes, I'm having a craving. I need your salve back. And he <laughs> says, I thought I was done, but it just, that, it just helps so much. And, and so he has it again, but yeah, not, not fun, but salves can his, be his used. His brother recently amazingly. healed a burned hand using that same, same salve. salve. That was yep. incredible. That was quite doctor a doctor told him, if I had this burn, you got two choices. Go to the doctor and go to the go burn to the center or go to the Westovers. And if it were me, I'd go to the Westovers. It was an electrical yeah. I loved it. And those are bad. Yeah. Those are nasty. Those are not fun ones. healed well with the salve. So um, the miracle salve is amazing. You can use it on anything. You, I've seen it with road rash from motorcycle accidents to major, major burns. And it amazing stuff it can get a little pricey if you're using it on large areas so it is very beneficial so to know how to make speaking your own. of price on salves way 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 back years ago uh -huh. when i didn't really have a good pricing system um someone asked me how much a salve cost and i my response was well that depends on how long it's been since i made it that's right the day after i make my kitchen oily making a salve it costs more than three months later when i, <laughs> when forgot, I forgot, forgot to bake the neck it was yeah <laughs> They have a fairly decent shelf life. I like to keep mine in the fridge. Uh, my husband doesn't like it in the fridge, and so typically we have either. we have one in, on the counter. But I like it in the fridge because if there's any type of an injury, the cold keeps it from swelling. And I like just that feel of the cold going on. I'm spoiled. So, there's the one in the fridge and the one in the bathroom. Yeah, we typically have one both places <laughs> and one in the milk barn. And yeah, yeah it's actually amazing for little cuts on on udders. It it's great. So we use it on just about everything. Um, that there are some other ones besides the Miracle Sabbath. Yes, there are. Probably the one that I use the most would be the BHM Plus, and that's because if it's infected, if one of my kids doesn't tell me about something until after it's already infected, like, oh, Mom, I didn't think this was a big deal, but now look what I've got. The BHM Plus is going to pull that staff. infection, so it draws it's it an out. an excellent drawing stuff. Yep. There's one called CM that's really good for skin rashes. And um, in the book or in the recipe section, if you go to butterflyexpressions.org, um, under information for herbs, there's a recipes link and you can find the list of ingredients that's in all these different saps. But I wanted to get you the link for the instructions. And this is the written link. Let's see if I'm smart enough to do this. <laughs> I'm certainly not. Huh. Oh, there we go. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So there it is. That, no, nope, that's the wrong one. I'm really brilliant today. All right, oh, herbal salves, and that would be. I got a good night's sleep. That would be salves PDF. PDF. Wow, I really am tired. And then there's also in the blog there's going to be a link to how to make a video. It's a, well, how to make salves with a video, and so it walks you through step by step instructions, and you can actually see us making a salve. It's, it's Ginny, but that's. Um, it's cool, and and it's really not as hard as it looks. Once you've done it once, it's really not so bad. No, and yeah. Just a little messy because it's oil. Yeah. I guess so. so we talked about all the different ways to use external herbs. Um, salves, like we said, you wouldn't take those internally. Those would be an external thing. <laughs> now we're going to talk about the internal use of herbs. And that pretty much, I think, has to be started off with teas. Teas or an infusion or a tisane, which is another fancy word for the tea. But I like that word. <laughs> <laughs> I like the word tisane. I like that. Huh? I do. <laughs> so a tea or an infusion. 
So why would you do, well, it's probably down further, why to do a tea rather than a tincture, but um, let's talk about teas. Herbs pull differently in water than they do in alcohol. Yeah. And if I'm serious about the nutritional intake of an herb, I will take it both ways. With pregnant women, I always insisted that they do their raspberry leaf tea as a tea because that guaranteed that they got the water too. <laughs> there are some properties of, of raspberry that pull best in water. But on the other hand, the trade-off of that is often a person won't take the time to make a tea. They don't like the taste of it. They won't drink it. And well, you're better off with the tincture than with nothing. And with nothing. The tincture is very effective. It's a very effective way to do herbs, but I happen to like a warm tea. <laughs> I don't mind it. And, in the summer. and I sweeten it with honey. Um, See, I typically. prefer mine not. So. But, but that's a whole extra step. You got, I mean, it's really simple. You take your herbs, you put them in the bottom of your cup, and you pour hot water over it. And you let it seep for a little while, and then you have to strain it and drink it. But I actually bought um, your little tea, tea a ball. tea ball. I, mine's like a little canister, and the lid screws off, and it's probably about that big. And I just put it in my herb bag, scoop up some herbs, screw the lid on. It has a little chain and it hooks right over my cup. Then I fill, I usually make two while I'm at it. I make my son or my husband drink the other one. It doesn't take much longer to make two than one. Then I don't have to worry about straining the tea. But I have to get my honey out and put a spoonful of honey in it and have to stir it till the honey dissolves and I'm off to the next thing. I'm, I'm too busy. So I have started um, sweetening my tea with stevia. And I started doing it, I, I have two that I really like. I like the lemon, which is what I typically use, unless I'm making raspberry tea for my daughters for hormone-related issues. And then I will use the raspberry stevia because I think that it's really cool that raspberry tea actually tastes like raspberry. That's what it should taste like, <laughs> Aren't Mom. you clever? <laughs> and they'll, they'll drink it that way. My so. husband bought some cute little cups a, a while back. That they're ceramic, and they have little little Asian drawings on them. But the problem is they only do about six ounces of a tea. They're just too little. It's not enough tea. It's not enough for me. I mean, 12 to 18 ounces is more like what I'm going to want when I drink a tea. Yeah. So that never works. So teas, teas are amazing. Um, I think my favorite, go ahead and comment on your favorite if, the, if you have one. But my favorite is probably the mineral tea. I love the way I feel if I remember to drink my mineral tea every day. And see a chamomile, you know, a good, you know, something good sleepy relaxing. time or yeah, tummy something mint like that, or a tummy yeah. mint or tummy echinacea mint. cold, you know. <laughs> yeah, echinacea is a great tea when it's cold season. Peppermint is a good tea for calming tummy you troubles. Stay awake. Chamomile is a good soother to help you sleep. I mean, there's so many different amazing uses for tea, but I tend to drink tea in the morning. So I'm a give me my vitamins and minerals for the day. I need my energy. I got things to do. Aha, uh -huh. that's my personality. <laughs> anyway, um, this word right here, which I will not even attempt. Decoction. Decoction. That's Decoction. another word for tea. I like Kazan better. <laughs> Decoction. It's a, just another fancy way of saying a tea. Well, and, but it's a but, little different. Yes. With the decoction, you actually boil the herbs rather than just bring them to a boil and steep them. You don't want to boil a leaf. It'll, it'll kill it. But some of the roots and the harder woods, herbs that are done from the wood, they require boiling in order to bring the properties out. And that's what they call a, a decoction. decoction. <laughs> now, I didn't do an entire PDF page for how to make a tea because there's so many different ways to make a tea. But really, really, there's only one important thing is unless you're using roots and actually making a decoction, and not a tea, don't boil, don't boil them. them and death. put something over the top so that you don't lose all your volatile oils out the top. Just cover your cup for a few minutes while it's seeping. The other thing um, is the longer that it seeps, the better. Now, if you like warm tea, you're not going to want to let it seep. Mine <laughs> can be four hours before I remember to drink it. And I, drink it to come back after the honey had I prefer it warm. I really do. But I, I rarely drink my tea warm because I forget. But an odd thing for me teasing someone about lack of patience. Uh -huh. Yes. <laughs> I get cleaning my kitchen later. And I'm like, oh, yeah, my tea. And I down it. <laughs> but by then, it's typically stone cold. No, if um, I remember to drink a tea, it, it will be because I want an excuse to sit down with a book. And I will drink it warm. That's a good it. idea. I've got a book I want to read. Well, it used to be, I realized years ago, that the reason I gain weight is because I eat that extra sandwich so I can finish the chapter. No tea is much And when better. I started sitting down with herbal teas and, and taking my little breaks, I, that, that was funny. That kind of so stopped. <laughs> besides drinking tea for the nutritional benefits, um, you can actually use tea for eye care. Um, there's a... A combination called EB that and you make it a little bit different than a tea at, because you're not going to do an entire glass you're going to do just the tiniest tiniest amount just barely enough water to cover the herbs and you're going to let that seep for 
well, the first time you make it because the kid's got an eye infection, you're going to let it seat for 10 or 15 minutes. You're going to treat the eye. Then you're going to make some more and you're going to let it seat for like 12 hours so that you have really strong mm, to do no. the eye. That's, this is how four, I do it. Four or five hours. Four or five hours. The problem with, well, <laughs> with the EB is that you got to strain it so well. Yes, because you don't you're putting it in put the those, eye. And so I have found over the years that the best strainer ever is two layers of paper towel. You know what I do? Nope. I use a cotton ball because the bigger <laughs> no, fiber of the tea nothing, would it? soaks it up. Well, and then I just squish. I have the kid lay down and I'll squish the cotton ball and, and none of the big particles will stuck the cotton ball into it. That's after I've strained the worst of it out, of course. Yeah. But <laughs> okay. I always just did it. It works it really good for eye infections. You want to do it frequently, you know, like every couple of hours. And here's frequently. a word of warning for you. The worse the eye infection is, the more it burns. The first um, time. And it's my kids learned very young that when they thought their eyes had an infection to mention it, because if they waited overnight or waited till the next evening, you know, it was going to hurt. And it was going to hurt, hurt the first four or five times mom treated the eye. Yep. Another way that um, teas can be used is as a gargle or a mouthwash. Um, something like white willow that you wouldn't want to sit down and drink an entire glass of white willow. But it's, bitter. <laughs> yeah, it's rather bitter, but it's really good for um, infections in your teeth and your gums. And also um, white oak is excellent. For sorry, that white, white oak. That's white what oak, I meant. Yeah. And, but white willow has got amazing painkilling yeah. um, pain properties. properties. And so if you have a really bad dental thing going on, but you can't get into the dentist till Monday, or maybe you're just trying to rebuild an owl on the teeth, I, I will make it. Oh, but white oak is bitter. It takes it takes courage. That's <laughs> two of my kids right now that are doing that twice a day. White oak. <laughs> but it'll do it. it yeah, I got one. I, I did it too with a little problem. I had supposed to get her braces off recently. three months ago. And the dentist just, if you would just wear your bands for one month, we could take these off. And you need to go to the dentist. We got to hold this off. We got to hold this off. And he's finally told me, we're going to take them off and take her to the dentist and put them back on. And I oh, said, oh, no, no, we're not doing no, that. No, we're not doing that. So she's doing white willow, rather. She wants to or not. We're going to keep oh, those cavities in check, or maybe we'll get rid of them. I guess we'll see. So other to use for a tea, and this yep. requires a lot of tea, is as a soak. Yeah. Put soap. I have stopped what the doctor was calling gangrene on an old gentleman using the same herbs in BHM. BHM. Yeah. BHM, BHM dry herbs. But we made enough of it to put his entire foot into a five gallon bucket <laughs> and in that in that type of an instance you can actually i put it in a big um, roaster pan that goes on my stove we need a deeper it was far enough up his leg uh, i needed the whole height of the five gallon bucket. and then i will when i'm done with them soaking these over 20 minutes i will just put a lid on it and stick it aside and a few hours later i'll warm it up and i'll use the same herbs several times i think you have about a couple of days two to three days before it'll start to form a film on the top at which point you need to chuck it and start over so your dad doesn't think so, but, but I you do it anyway. Yeah, <laughs> trust me on that one. Time for a new one. So, all right, tinctures. And here's a loaded topic. There are hundreds and hundreds of tinctures. Butterfly sells a lot, but there are so many herbs out there and that can be made into a tincture. So the main thing that we're going to try to get through today is the difference between an alcohol tincture and a glycerin tincture, and then give you links for how to make them and videos that will show you so that if you want to make your own, that you can making your own tinctures can save you money it's so simple and it will save you money and butterfly has gone to the trouble of putting your making packs our together. basic recipes into packs so you don't have to buy it's each of your herbs and measure your own you just have to open the pack and dump it in <laughs> and then if you're using it as a liniment and then you're going through a lot of tinctures sometimes sometimes it's not worth it it's just easier to buy your own tinctures but sometimes you might want to make your own and it's really how easy? Well, let me tell you my story of the first tincture I ever saw made. Okay, I had allergies pretty bad back in those days. And so to go up and wildcraft herbs was a major disaster for me. That meant taking enough allergy pills that I'd try to stay awake in this carload of crazy women. And so we get up there and for two days, we hiked all over this mountain, identifying herbs and pulling them up. And and at the end of the day, the lady just tells us goodbye. And the only reason I'd gone is because she promised to teach us how to make a tincture. So I'll put your little hand. So I, I'll put my <laughs> little hand. And so she opens the back of her vehicle. It was one of those hatchbacky things. And and she hauls out a bottle of vodka and an empty one-quart canning jar. And she asks anybody if they have an herb handy. Well, dumb question. We've been we up there. Wild crafting. Know, wild crafting for... And somebody hands her one, and she shakes it vigorously. I'm assuming she was taking the dirt off it. I don't know. And she stuffs it in the jar, pours the alcohol over the top of it, no measuring, no anything, screws the lid on, and holds it up, 
shakes it two or three times and says, well, now take this home and shake it from time to time and wait about seven to 10 days and strain it. You're done. And I thought, okay, I just spent two days in the wild living on allergy pills. You could have emailed that. that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's absolutely true. So one little follow-up story. Years later, one of my sons, I wouldn't call him OCD, but he does borderline like things done right. And he decided that he was going through one of Michael Moore's books about what percent of alcohol to use for what herbs. And then he took how much my, herb per liquid, how much herb per liquid, the percentages. That, and then he went through all of my recipes and figured out, okay, now this is comfrey, so it needs this ratio of alcohol to water and this strength. And this one has a little cayenne, so it's going to need a little stronger alcohol. And he went through and he did the math on all of my recipes. Now, if you've seen my book, there's a lot of recipes. A lot of them. And I just let him do it. It's great math and calculator practice. And But I have to realize that what he had now was an alcohol ratio that wasn't perfect for any herb in there. Nope. It wasn't strong enough. For, for some, some of the herbs, too strong for others. You can't really get too strong. But anyway, but it was a great math experiment. <laughs> and I went back to dumping. The only reason there's those lovely little ratios on the butterfly packets is because Jeannie has some OCD. Jeannie does have some OCD. <laughs> and she got tired of asking questions. How well, much and it's more for a consistency thing. If you want it, butterfly is consistent because they sell we on sell a world it, market. So it had better be the same. So they do every exactly time. the same every time. And so what that ratio on their on the front of their label is, is what they do. It's what we you do want for the ones we like sell. Like what you could buy. That doesn't mean that you couldn't do a little more or you couldn't do a little less and be just fine. But the basic rule of thumb is use a strong enough alcohol if it's a root or a cayenne, then you're going to want the 100 proof vodka. Anything else, the 80 proof will do it. How much do you use? Make sure your herbs are well covered in the alcohol, because if they poke up and they didn't get sufficiently alcohol before they floated to the top, you might get a little mold. So and that's why you shake them and stir them on frequently. a daily basis. So the, the more alcohol you use, then the less the more drops of tincture you're going to need to get your effect. But then if you soak them a little extra time, then that's good. There's so many variables. <laughs> you know, so many variables anyway. You can actually. But in nutrition, who cares rather you eat one egg or an egg and a half? I mean, you know. Or, or, yeah, this is a, a new discussion. <laughs> I was reading an article yesterday about a lady who was comparing um, calories to if you drink a big gulp to how much broccoli you'd have to eat to get the same amount of calories. <laughs> and then she went through all the nutritional benefits you'd get from eating that much broccoli. And then she concluded the article by saying, but nobody could possibly do that because in order to eat that many calories of broccoli, you'd have to eat 21 cups of broccoli. So you're not going to get that much nutrition from, from yeah, just, just don't drink the big gulp was the. The big gulp the, of what? No. That's what it's called. It's called the big gulp. I, I know what you're talking about. You talk, what's in the big gulp? 21 tablespoons of sugar. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's enough to kill you right there. But anyways, it was a fascinating study, but I, I was, it was my light reading for the day, I guess. <laughs> anyways, what is important is that the tincture be left tincturing the herbs in the alcohol for at least a week. Um, Butterfly does too. And I le once left rose hips in my counter for, oh, I've left in my cabinet for, for months and they're fine. I mean, well, one other variable okay. too, what we found over the last few years is that as companies began freeze drying their herbs rather oh. than air drying, the potency of the tincture went up. And instead of using a full dropper full, six or seven drops oh, so was sufficient. Freeze. There's so many variables. And I know now somebody out there is saying to themselves, well, we need to standardize all this and we need to know how many. Please bear in mind, these are these are not drugs. These are natural They're, products. It's just nutrition. It's like, okay, you don't weigh a carrot and say, I can only have this many, you know. <laughs> And it's hard to overdose on an herb. You yep. have to work at it. You, and then you'd have to be kind of criminally stupid because you ignored the diarrhea. You ignored the, you know, you'd have to, you know, they're, they're food. They work because they're food. If you're wild crafting herbs, that's great. Um, one thing I tend to do when I wild craft, which honestly I don't, don't do have a time to do a whole lot, lot of, of yeah. um, is to stay away from highways and roads because yes. there's pollutants from cars and things. If you can go up into the mountains or out into the forest, or grow them in your own yard. Those are the herbs I am more likely to use. I always like to do my wild crafting just before the July 4th weekend when all the campers were up there stomping on everything. Yeah. And because it's the time where the majority of the herbs I wild crafted were just at their peak. Now, a lot of them grow in your yard. 
now a lot of them <laughs> yes i made the mistake of planting peppermint in a flower bed last year it's taking over the place oh uh, yes that's okay <laughs> we actually have bought some acreage a little ways away from us and and it hasn't had hasn't had human hand laid to it for a long time and there's a a lot of overgrowth and, and my husband and I are taking it on, but I'm looking at the down the, through the river, there's a bunch of stinging nettle growing. I'm like, well, yeah, we can get rid of most of it. But well, we gotta leave a little, little bit of stinging nettle right there. Like was, <laughs> a, a guy was asking me yesterday, he thinks he wants to grow yarrow for, and, and figure out how to distill it for, okay, and I'm telling fun. him, well, you know, the problem with yarrow is you better plan on your whole farm Become being yarrow, yarrow because in five years, it won't be just the field you planted it in, it'll be everywhere. <laughs> Incidentally, stinging nettle contains an absolute amazing amount of vitamins and nutrients. Absolutely. So, yeah, yeah I actually got into it and, and it, because there's so many other weeds I was having a hard time seeing. So what's it, growing but, at the bottom of it that helps with the nettle rash? I've never seen nettle grow on its own that there wasn't gallium oh, no or, idea. or one of the little ones that you can pull and rub on the rash to make it go away. I wasn't paying any attention. i got to come over and see <laughs> now, see what's oh, growing I've got, naturally I've got, along the bank. I've got so much burdock and... <laughs> And hemlock. yarrow. You can do without the hemlock. I, the hemlock's <laughs> going. It was my focus this year. But there are so many amazing, wonderful herbs over on my farm that I'm going to have to contain but not eliminate. I can just go to your place to wildcraft. Yeah, my place would be. <laughs> I'm so excited. Anyway, it's All wonderful. Right, so let's All talk right. about the difference between glycerin and alcohol. All right. Glycerin mm, <laughs> tastes better. No. <laughs> it does. There are actually herbs that pull better in glycerin. There are some herbs that won't pull in an alcohol, oh, like well. wild cherry. Anything that has to do with the lung and the bronchioles seems to pull better in glycerin, yep. which is kind of nice because if you're treating a child for any kind of a RSV or you know anything like that, we prefer you, you prefer a glycerin tincture because they'll take it and you're yeah. not giving the. One of the alcohol. major differences between a glycerin and alcohol is shelf life. An alcohol tincture has an, an um, amazing, yeah, like you can have an alcohol tincture 20 years old and it's still going to be good. Um, a glycerin tincture, not so much. You have somewhere four to seven years. I mean, there's still a long shelf life, but it's not. I used not to indefinite. think two to three, and then I started putting just a tiny little bit of benzoin, benzoin oil. oil, just a few drops in each batch of tincture, yep. and they definitely last far longer. Way, way, way better. So benzoin just, makes a good preservative. Um, so talk, examples of, of tinctures that are better done in glycerin. The CC is probably the one that comes, well, the WC, but but it's out of alphabetical order. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> CC comes to mind first, and that is called, it's a children's compound, and it is anytime my kids get sick, and they'll take it straight. I mean, so the glycerin that the one is that so your husband sweet. took into the mission field with him that really liked? I don't know. I think so. That seemed to be one of his favorites. I don't remember. You know, it's, it's an excellent one for early symptoms of flu and colds, and it's just the first thing to reach for if you think your child's getting sick. And most kids will just take it straight and just squirt on a spoon and give it to them if they want it in water or juice. That's not a big deal either. But, yeah, but most people, most kids will just take it straight. It's quite a pleasant one, actually. Um, so. Men, like I drink the men herb pack as a tea. I talked about that earlier. It's actually also done as a glycerin tincture. It's also done as an alcohol. I think the herbs pull a little better in the glycerin. I like it better as a glycerin. Yeah, yep, and it, that sweetens it. And makes it One taste of the differences we should tell them about it between glycerins, maybe I'll wait to get done with. No, WC MC. is the last one. And WC is a cough syrup. Um, it's wild cherry cough syrup. It's and more than a cough syrup. It's what they call an expectorant. Yeah. So if there's a lot of mucus anywhere, even in the stomach or the bowels, this will WC. be effective for that. Although we typically use it for coughs and lung conditions. That's what it's known for. <laughs> and it is different from most glycerin tinctures. So we talked about how to make an alcohol tincture. You just put your herbs in a bottle, dump stuff all over them, shake, shake, shake. Not, not terribly difficult. Um, a glycerin tincture is a little bit more difficult because it has to be cooked. It has to be cooked. You have to apply heat to it. So you get your herbs in your jar. Um, it's about 60% glycerin, 40% water, if I remember right. That is correct. Um, it has to be at least 60. Some books will say 50-50, but it's not. Strong. I do 60-40. It's a little better. So then you're going to put this in a pot of boiling water. And I like to put a few canning lids or something to keep it up off of the heat because you're talking uh, about glass. It's not like to. You better do that yeah. or your jar <laughs> it's, it's is liable important. to crack. <laughs> so, or just a, or a double rack boiler. Or a canning jar. Any kind of a double boiler will work. And you cook that for three or four hours. The nice thing about a glycerin tincture is that's it. You're done. Your tincture is available. If you have a need for a tincture and you need it right now, doing it as a glycerin, it's available within a few hours. Doing it in an alcohol, it's Not available away. in a week or two. So that's the nice thing about glycerins. But the interesting thing about WC 
is that wild cherry doesn't like heat, but it doesn't pull in an alcohol. So you actually make your glycerin tincture and then add your wild cherry after that so that it, it doesn't only get needs hot. To, it only needs to sit maybe 24 hours. I've done it in 8 or 12 when I needed the tincture quickly. Yeah, but yeah, you got to sit your glycerin, your wild cherry and your glycerin, sit it on the cupboard a day or two and then make the rest of your wild cherry and cook it. So, so the instructions for that one would need to be specifically followed out of the book. It, it is... You, yeah, start with the alcohol tincture, and, and then when closer, you, and then WC. When you put your <laughs> your thing of herbs in your gallon jar or your quart jar, or whatever, in your water, please put a lid on them once again. You know, don't let the herbs don't let them boil away. So you can find those specific instructions inside of that recipe section on butterflyexpressions.org. Um, yeah. There is one more type of tincture, and we don't do a lot with it anymore. We have monkeyed around with it a lot in the past, and that's a vinegar tincture. She tests it. The one vinegar tincture that is important to know is the one we call APL. Yeah, it's Mountain based Center. on an old John Christopher recipe. I don't like APL okay. either, though, but I take it. No, it's it. it's pure dub nasty. But. It is outright <laughs> downright nasty, but it is. The joke in our family was the year someone spilled a quart of it down the drawers of the kitchen. I swear nobody no, got sick all winter just smelling the Or thing. the time that Matthew, not Matthew, he looks like Matthew, but it's Richard, <laughs> dropped. <laughs> It on the stairs. Dropped a gallon in the carpet and stairs. Yeah. yeah the that carpet really ended fun. up coming out because it smells so bad. It's got garlic in it and it's got vinegar <laughs> in it. And that, but it is, it's, you know, APL. It, was it a, is the big guns. Okay. It used to be called anti plague. I mean, it, it is, it's the big guns. And, and if somebody's sick and you really, really don't have time to get but it, let's, let's talk about gun. vinegar tinctures for just yes. a minute. Like she mentioned that most herbs don't pull well in vinegar. And that's true to a certain extent. Um, it's just it's nasty. They're nasty in vinegar. And in yeah. my experience, kidney herbs do not pull that way. Um, they, we tried for a while. We experimented a lot with it because of the alcohol issue. And we just didn't get good results. So then we experimented with part alcohol and part vinegar. And even that didn't work well. But I came across an interesting author that was talking about Old, old, way back, you know, pine, uh, nope, don't roll me back Sorry. down. Way back, he said vinegar or alcohol, roll me down a little further. He, no, no, the other way. Up, up, there you go. All right. Sorry. <laughs> Inwardly taken, he said, alcohol tinctures warm and comfort the bowels. And since bowel issues seem to be a Westover thing, no wonder we liked our alcohol tinctures. He said, strengthens the inward parts, expels wind, in other words, helps with gas flatulence. and flatulence, <laughs> is an excellent traumatic, and you'll have to see it the way it's spelled, the old English spelling, is drying and astringent, and therefore good against all fluxes of the bowels and weakness of the generative parts. And, but then he goes on to talk about vinegar and he says it has the same virtues. Now I'd have to argue with that, but <laughs> it opens even more, removes the obstructions of stomach, liver, spleen, and other bowels, oh. whereby it effectually, effectually stops vomiting, strengthens the stomach, and causes a good appetite and a strong digestion. But it stops not fluxes of the bowels so well as some of the former alcohol type preparations. So. You know, I, that, I guess this caught my eye because how long, you know, that stops not sentence puts it right back about the time of the Revolutionary War or even England before that. That's how long herbs have been known to stop fluxes of the bowel and strengthen and how, the stomach. And, and how long know. they've been studying what is what's better. Is this herb pulls better than an alcohol or a glycerin or a t a vinegar? Um, one thing, though, that we want to mention about vinegar, there is... A yes, vinegar tincture. A vinegar. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I use a good vinegar, but um, there is a, a vinegar thing that we add tincture to. It's called HVC. So H stands for honey, vinegar, and then the C stands for cayenne. And so you'd make this. Um, it's used for a lot of things. Wow. But um, it, cold, it's used to stop bleeding. I absolutely insisted that my mother's, when I was on a delivery, have two quarts of this in their fridge. In their fridge. So, that, you know, it's it, cold. Cold. In case we needed to stop. But it. warm, it increases the blood supply and blood flow. So we'd have one quart of warm for the midwives Which makes to drink. It, gave us awake. <laughs> it makes it really good when you're sick or when, when my kids are sick. Some of them will make their own. Um, some of them will ask me to make it for them. But it's really simple. You just get nice, warm, almost boiling water, add 
couple tablespoons of honey, a couple, little bit of vinegar. And this about the same amount of about vinegar. the same amount. Me, I'm a little bit less because I'm not a lover of vinegar. Hate the vinegar. Braggs isn't nearly as bad though. I don't know if it's because it's, it's a quality vinegar or cold. And then cayenne, and they they say thirty to forty drops, but this is a trust me, you don't want thirty to forty drops of butterflies cayenne. <laughs> no, you don't. And this is a personal thing. Like I can't handle near as much cayenne as my husband can. He's going to put a lot more in there, and that heat just kills the sore throat. The vinegar, the cayenne coats it. The vinegar changes the acidity of the body, and the cayenne kills it. And it's just absolutely amazing for a sore throat of any kind. And just for fun, you know, when my kids were doing a lot of vocal lessons and things, they would drink it before they had one. They called it penny juice. It was penny their juice. their voice. <laughs> the voice teacher would have some for everybody before they did performances. So vinegar definitely has its place in the herbal world, but it's not a tincturing medium as far as we're concerned most of the time, except for APL. <laughs> okay, we already talked we already about talked your wild crafting. Um, we're, we're going to give you a little bit on our opinion of fresh versus dried, <laughs> and capsules versus <laughs> and capsules versus tea. So, what shall we tell them? Fresh, um, fresh is generally better. Fresh is always better. If you go out and make a, a cup of tea out of peppermint growing in your garden, that's going to be a way better cup of tea than a dried box off the grocery store shelf. And if you're buying an herb, I had a UPS driver tell me once that. And that was before we were really into essential oils. He says, I, I just hate it when I have to bring packages to your house because the whole truck stinks. <laughs> and so I opened the box for him and it was inside another box. So we opened the second box and inside that box was a big plastic Bag. sealed thing. And inside of that were all the packages of herbs that were also inside of bags. <laughs> That's when you know you've got a I good I just told him, I said, well, you know, if you pick up a package to bring to me and it has an herbal, indicates that it's coming from an herbal shop and you can't smell it, you might just as well do that good into the car. <laughs> we don't want it anyway. I'm not going to want it anyway. I was up to a store a couple of hours away and they had bulk spices. I'm like, oh, this is so wonderful. And I was going through getting all my bulk spices. I've been needing to place an order. I just haven't had time. Here they are. I can just take them home with me. And I had three or four of them in my hand before I realized I was standing in a big room full of herbs and I yeah. couldn't smell them. Couldn't smell the herbs. And even just the same thing with spices. These were things I was going to cook with. I didn't want them. And as I walk into a shop and I see these clear cellophane bags hanging on little no. hooks exposed to the light and the air. And they're not dark bags even. They're just, I think, well, there's absolutely no Nothing point. Left. There's no medicinal value left in those herbs. Thank you, Tammy. I love that comment. I, I think I know how to. Yeah. If you can't, if I'm you can't not smell technical it, today, but you might thank you, well Tammy, for that comment. That's very cool. What did she say? She said we look gorgeous and that she loves our father. Oh, yeah, like, yeah I'm, I'm not buying that. Okay. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> You're fine, but uh, I always think I'm surprised go how washed out and old I look when I'm, I don't ever look at myself. Okay. So, okay, enough on that. Um, dumb topic. So, if you are wild crafting your own herbs and you're going to dry your own herbs, do so in a dark place. Um, if you can possibly hang them upside down or put them in a cookie sheet and put them in a dark room or at least a room that gets less traffic than. So that you can close yeah, the curtains, close the doors, and keep it a little of dark. A years ago, I sent someone out better. to cut comfrey, and when I looked around, they were on cookie sheets stuck in my lighted windows. <laughs> she has a big four foot by four no, foot. No, no. A whole wall of these glass windows. A like, wall of That's not windows. the place to drive. No, no, that wasn't the quite what I had in mind. <laughs> yeah. um, but back in old times, like Victorian period, they, they used to have an entire house that would be for drying, or out, an outside greenhouse, and they would dry them hang in there. Them, hang, and hang them upside around down. Their, and hang them up. And I thought that was really cool. And I love to do that in my kitchen someday just for the look of it. Just, just for the herb you feel. But they do do a little better away from the light. But this, I mean, this is not, it's not a reason not to use it. Especially if you use essential oils. It's You're okay. getting the volatile oils that you might lose some percentage of if you dry them improperly. Yeah, I mean, you're not, not losing the, the nutritional value. What is important is that as you go to put it in that jar or in that tea, that you can still smell it. But, it, <laughs> but it's still a decent herb and it hasn't been. So let's talk about powdered capsules. Oh, yay. That is the way I was introduced <laughs> to herbs. You know, get, get a powder, stuff it in a capsule. But the quality of the herb, as you pulverize it, You've exposed it to air. Yep. And depending on the company you buy from, how long did it sit in an open vat until they got around to getting it into the capsule and getting it? I have found, I mean, sometimes they're very effective and there are companies I trust and I buy powdered herbs from. But Occasionally. Ugh, no, for the most part, that's the least effective way to take an herb. And besides which, I don't like swallowing capsules particularly well. No. 
No, a tea is best. A tincture is second best. Both is a wonderful idea. A powdered but capsule is probably my least, powdered capsule is least not. favorite way to take it. And if they've done something to it so that they've got it stuck together so it makes some hard little knot. Without that thing, gel you know, capsule? Without the gel cap to hold it together. No. And there is one other thing. There is some some unscrupulous companies who actually extract them using chemicals and then they dry that liquid that extract and so they're drying only a part of the herb they haven't got the whole plant there and besides you've got some leftovers of the chemicals that they used yeah. and so you're actually ingesting things you don't want to it's important to buy your herbs from a reputable com reputable company who is wild crafting them yep and or to wildcraft we'll, we'll them give yourself. You the name is up our favorite places. We don't mind that you go around and buy your own herbs and learn on your own. Best thing to do though is just, the just buy them. But I think Butterfly sells most of their herbs in, in four ounces, in eight ounces, and in pounds. And then they sell all their combinations in two sizes, a half pack and a full pack. So you can you can make it and try it. You can make a full batch and yeah. share it with all your friends. Um so yeah, <laughs> comparing dried herbs to fresh herbs. It, it, I still remember so my, much more to it than my it. first alcohol tincture. I went over to the local liquor store, went in the back door, <laughs> and and bought a case of vodka. And my mother got a phone call. I was forty some. <laughs> yeah, I probably was quite that old. My mother got a phone call before I got it in my trunk. <laughs> Elaine Meath <laughs> says that she loves her tinctures. Yeah, yeah, I can't even imagine life without my tinctures. Um, they're a daily thing for me. But me too. I, I don't think there's been a day in the last. 35 40 years that I haven't taken a tincture for some reason or another. Yep. yep Yep, so I love this it says dried or even fresh herbs whether in whole form or pulverized still contain some indig Indigestible by plant human fibers. plant fibers. You can't go out and graze. We're not cows. We're not cows <laughs> that, So because tincturing and tea making progress the process has broken down those fibers which they're then discarded we still get the nutrients without having to digest all the plant fibers, which we're not meant to. Wheatgrass juice had a huge um, following following a few years ago, and people were juicing wheatgrass, and it was more digestible because it was juice, but you, there was still fibers in there that couldn't be broken down. And ultimately, people decided that it was doing more damage to their digestive systems than good. It was. It did. It had a great deal of good. There was a lot of nutrients there, um, but I think what the was the real extremists would be the people who would they would juice their wheatgrass and then they would drink the juice which i think was probably okay and then they would chew the fibers and it like a gum fibers, huh? instead of buying gum or you know mm. i don't think that was a good idea so we need to take our herbs they're amazing gifts from god and we need to make them into teas make them into tazan right. so can <laughs> teachers, can you overdo herbal medicine of course you can yeah many years ago my sweet person I won't name, um, bought a bought a juicer mm -hmm. and began juicing carrots. Oh, Dan had a companion that did this on his mission. Until her skin and the whites of her eyes turned orange. orange. You know, um, I you suppose like nothing but carrots. If you yes. overdo any particular herb over and over and over too much of it, I've never actually seen it with an herb tea, <laughs> but I suppose you could. There are some herbs recommended as super super duper body cleansers I had one particular herb tea I would only allow a gentleman a certain amount of I wanted to clean his liver I didn't want to kill him and four or five months later he comes back to me and he's looked up the recipe and he's bought the herb somewhere else and he's been on this thing I told him to do for only 10 days it took us some time to rebuild his kidneys yeah but like I say you know that's kind of it's criminally stupid. it's hard so. and your basic herbs like chamomile and peppermint and you're not going to overdo those ones. Just not, not. not without floating yourself away. <laughs> I drink I drink mineral tea almost every day. I've been doing it for years. I, I feel better when I do it. I have more energy. Um, I my son has joined me on this quest because he's, I think it's hormones. He's, he's a boy, but still, I think what we've been doing is hormones. And so I started him on mineral tea just for nutrition, and he is a different kid. He is. His attention span so, is better. He's just better, better, better. So. Yeah. Um, one of the most important things about wildcrafting, making your own herbal preparations, is gratitude. Be grateful for the amazing world of of herbs that God has given us. It's an incredibly well stocked pharmacy. Every living thing works better 
if we it's appreciate it. <laughs> Herbs are no different. So, yep. Um, whenever you feel overwhelmed, there's so much to learn, and I just don't know the best thing. Be grateful for what you do know. Be grateful for that this time I have this little piece. I, I I know I could do this. It might not be the best thing that I could do. Somebody else might have done something else, but at least I knew to do this. Yeah, I I I know to put arnica on a bruise now. I didn't know that before. One thing. I know that a little peppermint will settle a child's tummy. You know, I know that while cherry cough syrup will act as an expectorant and they'll cough up mucus or throw up. I wish I knew it all, but yeah. And it's amazing to me whenever I remind myself of that attitude to be more grateful, how the next piece that I've been looking for, I've had this issue forever and ever. Just ever. I just into your lap. Yep. And here it is all of a sudden. Well, if you, if you appreciate that, then maybe it's time for the next one. <laughs> so, and then there's this little last sentence or two about personal responsibility. You know, it's lovely to buy your tinctures and we love you to do that. But it's just learning, learning how to care for your health, that personal responsibility piece. You'll be surprised how much that changes how you feel about your illness. And how you feel about your herbs. I mean, to me, a chronic illness, you go to the doctor, he's responsible for that. When when you seek answers yourself and you win, Oh, that's that. I just can't even be described. You know, yep. there's such a, a plus to your mental and emotional state to know that you knew that you made the difference to yourself or your yep. children. So. Yep. so use your herbs with gratitude and and we hope that you've enjoyed this live. If you have any questions, feel free to shoot them we over certainly to have us fun. No. <laughs> on our on our Facebook page. And um the nice thing about the Facebook pages is if you have a question about how to do something, someone on that group will have already done it. They'll have. Don't I love it? You'll be able to get so many different opinions on. I'm about to do this. Should I do this or this? People. If I don't check in on that page great. every three or four hours, they gave all the answers already, I would have given anyway. It's yeah. not that I'm ignoring you people. They just already answered it. It's amazing how smart that group of people is. So if you're not already part of that Facebook group, it's Butterfly Express Essential Oils on Facebook. And there's. A whole bunch of people. I think at last time I looked, there's about fifty-one thousand people following that page, and <laughs> it's amazing how how large the herbal community actually is. And there's several people that comment all the time, and they're and they're, they're very they're walking the walk, they're living the life, and they are more than happy to help you. And, and we do try to check it several times a day, also. So and help each other. Once you've learned something, follow the page and help others along. This is an amazing it's an amazing journey. So it was good to see you. Thanks for listening and making it all the way to the end of our long ramble today. <laughs> we'll catch you in two weeks.